is part seven of Abominable Snowman Legend Come to Life. And I'm going through this brutal, another brutal section. Man, I mean, the different languages and the, just the words, you just don't know. You don't know if you're saying half the words right, so please forgive me. I am I'm not a linguist and I barely can speak English, so... It says here, a list of encounters with l let alone. So a list with counters, encounters left. A list of encounters with let alone mere sightings of ABSMs throughout the Pamers region generally as defined above are literally endless. The same can be said of other major areas of the Mongolian Upland Triangle. These areas are as follows. I have to go through this freaking brutal list here. Um, first, the Upland Plateau of Tepet, with its three principal super mountain ranges, and the south, the Rim, with the Karakoram, in the middle, the Kunlun's that turn south uh, to the head of Indochina, and along the north is Al Altai Anton Tok <coughs> that leads into the Nan Shans and onto the. Um, Sin Lings of China. Second north of the Parmers lies the Al Al, Al I guess it's L I which one is not pronounced? Um L Tuck. What is called Ella Tuck? Who knows, maybe the I is pronounced Shanghai L I Tuck. This was Ally Tuck, and from them stretch the Tain Shens to form the northern boundaries, boundary of the Tamrim Basin of Xinjiang. North, next north of these come the Grand El El Tai forming the southern border, border of the Mongolia proper. North of these are the Tanun Ola, I don't know if I said it right, and the mighty uh, Kangai between the Mongolia and Tanu Tuva. Still north again come the Sayan complexes of the <clears throat> all the uh, calls, uh, bay calls is where it is. The bay calls lying along the shore of the Great Lake. I guess it's Bacalls. The same name, so the Lake Bacall and the Bacalls. Okay, then in the Gobi Desert lie the um, Yabola Novi Mountains. <laughs> Finally, there are the Kin Gangs, the Kin Gens, running s uh, north to south between the Gobi and the eastern lowlands of Manchuria. Uh, there is some suspicion that the ABS Emery may have to be extended still further north through the uh, Stanovios, Stanovios, um, to the uh, Dishong, the Dishors, and Gedan Mountains. <laughs> Which border they see of Oak Holtz, Holtz? Fuck if I know I'm saying this right. There is also a most important triangle sandwiched between the 
Nan Shans and the eastern end of the Tibetan, Tibetan Rim and the upper end of the Indo-Chinese Peninsula that has no collective name but is filled with immense north to south ranges. This lies in the uh, Xinjiang, now incorporated into the Chinese province of um, Switzerland. Switzerland. Or Switzerland. I, I know I'm not saying it right, and I'm not going to try anymore because if I can't memorize the words after three or four tries to try to get it right, that ain't going to happen for me. So, Switzerland. 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 When all these sub areas or natural provinces will be found on map 15, with the exception of the penolamated pen group. The penolamate, the penolam ultimate, pen, uh, pen ultimate, okay except for the penultimate group which are in far eastern Siberia from which we have no def definite ABS Amory I cannot stress too forcefully the sheer volume of such reports and those of foot tracks droppings and other corollary evidence that have been found year after year all over uh, these um, sub areas within the great upland Mongolian triangle. The full record of those that have been published, some 200, that have been properly investigated and assessed scientifically by competent <clears throat> specialists will form the subject of another book. For now, I shall have to confine myself to a few uh, samples and some further explanatory remarks about the country, vegetation, and general um, background against which they were recorded. Now, it's interesting, this is very much the, the and those who, and the few that pay attention to me, and no one will probably hear this anyways, um, we're going to post it. Um, is um, the like Hitchhiker effect, the the um, anomalies, and the uh, high strangeness? They don't seem to talk about this, right? They don't want to talk about this, and I don't think you can understand what we're dealing with without that. I think it's great that they're figuring out, you know, there's different types of primates and monkeys and you know, this, that, and the other, but that's, you know, the big story is something much more um, beyond this, and I understand why he's avoiding it, but I'm sure he knows about it, and if he has really done any of this kind of research, he's f experienced some, I mean, feels research that is instead of textbook stuff, and he sounds like he's a guy who it was a great adventure, and it had been all over the place, and spent a lot more time in the wilderness than any of us have, or ever will. And so, for him not to ever bring that up, uh, it's a bit cowardly of him, I would say. Even if it violates his worldviews. But he does hint it about it here and there, but he doesn't go in any, he just kind of hints. Anyways, first the general Parmars region and the Russian expedition brought to light half a dozen of the most most recent and cate categoric reports. One was supplied by a man described as a quite well-to-do resident in uh, Chesteb, who did a lot of hunting for pleasure. In 1939, in the spring, about 4 o'clock, in the afternoon, while he was walking around, he saw some man who actually jumped on him. They uh, started wrestling. This was the glue, the ju uh, 
G U L B I A V A N. The Ghoul uh, Biavan. The hunter was very strong and tall and heavy, and once he was able to lasso the, the, a bear, once he was able to lasso a bear, now this hunter wrestled with Ghoul Biavan. And the Ghoul Biavan was covered with short, soft wool and the man could not get hold of anything. It sounds familiar, like some, like it's a different story. On the face of this man, there was all sorts of wool, and there was a terrible odor coming from him. Finally, the hunter was able to throw the ghoul van to the ground. I have a hard time believing this. If this was a real Sasquatch, this is a real story, no way. But at the same time, he lost consciousness himself. Now, that makes sense. The villagers came uh, and, upon the man and brought him home. When he came to, it was late in the evening, and he told how he met the ghoul by a van, and the villagers told him that he was lying on the ground, and the ground around him was bore evidence of the wrestling match. In the same area, intelligent local people had uh, people made many sworn statements such as a man in Roharv or Roharv was traveling with two others through the pass of Karatinjan and the Vahoy. I think it's Vahoy. But I don't know. Vahio, maybe it's Vahio. Uh, when they saw a naked man covered with short black hair, who was slightly taller than the average ordinary man, and which had a very strong smell. <clears throat> As elsewhere, all 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 over the world. This matter of a strong stink attached to SBSMs keeps cropping up throughout the East Eurasian cases. Then there was a hunter at Dam, uh, Kar, uh, Karimov, something like that, Karimov, from a place called Uskrug between uh, Roharv and uh, Bodadai, Bodadai. He called the creature, he encountered a, uh, a, vial, a vialta, vialta? Um, just another local name for an ABSM. It was not much bigger than a man I was covered with hair, but not much on the chest. Really? That's the first time I heard that. I saw that one from Romania. I think it's fake. But then again, I could be wrong. Subject to change. Always subject to change. I mean, we're dealing with something that's beyond uh, our understanding. And beyond zoologists' understanding, unfortunately, or anthropologists, or any neurologist. It was not much bigger than a man, it was covered with hair, uh, but not much on his chest. It had a bare face and ears sticking out, really, and it did not have much hair. Rather pleasantly, the report states that. At the time, and Dam met the Voita, he was leading a goat, but gave way to him. The Volta, a group of hunters named Alerer, Altai Metei, Beck Sugar. <clears throat> don't 
count on any of the names being right, and Tess Stambeck, who were with the reporter and his father, one Abdora Manov, Abdul <laughs> Hamid, uh, when it camped for the night, it heard something tearing lightly in the grass and running out apparently with a light saw the, what they called a ghoul biaban, about six feet six inches tall, covered in hair, covered with hair, had a powerful and unpleasant smell that was in 1951. Some of these most interesting information collected on East Eurasian APSMs comes from um, Kuklov's original inquiries at the beginning of this, this, this century. Uh, mentioned above, um, Kuklov um, obtained most of this through that group of Kazakh nation which had moved northeast and settled along the edge of the Great Barrier and north of um, <clears throat> Kirkus. Between the Abkin Mountains and Tanyu Tuva. <laughs> These people were actually foreigners to and were not acquainted with the uplands beyond the barrier, but they penetrated into it via certain lowland basins having interests uh, pointing to the west. The most notable of these is called um, uh, I don't know, choose it with a, a Dungara or Dungora, which is an immense lowland pocket and to which the western steppes, i.e. prairies to us, penetrate via two great valleys separated by the Tarbagatai Mountains, a patient inquiry by Kolov uh, elucidated the fact that reports gathered by the Kazas, Kaz, the Kaska, the Kazakhs, uh, from a wide area seem all to come from uh, Dunsgara. Uh, Kovlov makes a point of noting that these reports came from herders, hunters, and those engaged in other pursuits strictly in order numerically. Um, okay. He first, his first most astonishing discovery, which has recently been much confirmed, was that the ABSMs from that region had been seen, captured, left footprints in sand, had an odor, resisted capture, yelled, lived in captivity for a while. One witness, a Kazakh, stated that he was in the mountains of Iran, Kaburk, and once all together with local herders, was taking care of a herd of horses at night. Towards dawn, they saw some men prowling around and suspecting a thief, they jumped on the saddle, taking a long, a long, long poles with n nooses, which are used to catch horses, arcans, uh, lassos. But the man was running uh, awkwardly and not too fast. They succeeded in capturing him. While he was being captured, the man was yelling, or rather screeching like a, like a hare, looking at the captors 
captured creature or the herder explained to the visitor that this is a wild creature not doing any harm to, to anyone and that he should be released. The wild man was a male of below average height. <clears throat> oh, fun, get some, some drawings. Woo. Covered with hair like a young camel, he had long arms far below his knees, stooped and with shoulders hunched forward. His chest was flat and narrow. The forehead sloped over uh, the eyes with pr prominently arched brows. Low jaws was massive. See, the lower jaw was massive without any chin. Nose was small with large nostrils. The ears were large without any loop, lobes. Uh, pointed back uh, like fox. On the back of his neck was a rise or uh, a, like a hoods. Like a hoods? Okay, why don't you say hood? The skin of the forehead and elbows and knees hard and tough. Uh, when he was captured, he was standing with his legs spread, slightly bent in the knees. Uh, when he was running, he was spreading his feet and wide apart, um, awkwardly swinging his arms. The, the instep of the wild animal resembled a human, but at least twice the size with widely separated fingers, toes, uh, the large toe uh, being shorter than that of a human's and widely spread uh, from the others. The arms with long fingers was like a human arm and yet different. And when the wild man, at the insistence of the herders, was allowed to go free, both Kazakh followed him and discovered the place into which he had vanished. An indentation under a hanging rock strewn with high grass. The local residents offered additional information about these creatures. That they lived in pairs, seldom seen by people, and not at all dangerous to humans. The second witness found by uh, Koklov, or yeah, Koklov, whatever, Koklov, um, stated that for several months he observed a wild man in the region of the river Manas, or dam. This creature of female sex was for sometime chained to a small mill but was also allowed to go free. The general description was the same as of the male. Hairy covered skin, stooped narrow chest, uh, shoulders were inclined forward, long arms, bent knees, uh, flat insteps, spread out toes resembling a paw and contact with the ground flat without the instep. The head is described as the same fashion, absent of a chin and rise in the back. This creature seldom issued any sounds and usually was quiet and silent. Only when approached, she bared her, her teeth and screeched and it, it had a peculiar way of lying down or sleeping like a camel by squatting on the ground on his knees and elbows. So we read this friend. This is another one that, that uh, Keel took from this book as well, right? Um, knees and elbows resting the forehead on the ground and resting the wrist and the back of the head. See, sketch. This position uh, accounts for the unusual hard skin of the elbows and knees, like camel soles. 
when offered food, the female ate only raw meat and some vegetables and grain. She did not touch cooked meal, meat, or grain, and although later she was getting used to bread. <clears throat> and this is supposed to be a hypothetical skull of the... Uh, I don't know, it's KSY uh, dash G I I K. Your guess is as good as mine. A uh, type of abominable snowman uh, as reconstructed by Russian scientists. And uh, that's be the top. And then center drawing made by Professor Koklov or Chotlov of uh, the Almas type of abominable snowman sleeping from native descriptions. And this is just looks like that. It looks like a terrible way to sleep. Uh, bottom left, it could be. I, 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 man, my your legs and your arms would fall asleep, wouldn't they? Wouldn't they go numb if we did that? The bottom left, the ancient mask uh, from the Great Mongolian Plateau. So that must be an ancient mask. And bottom right is a reconstruction of the head and face of a creature on mask drawn by Russian scientists. <clears throat> And I would not be surprised if that wrong, drawing is all wrong. And if it's anything like it is in the States, they come in different shapes and sizes. So there's no, it's from what I'm seeing. General, I mean, there's general, it's just the body shape and thick. I'm not talking about the face, I'm talking about the face in particular. Why do some look like more like humans and some look more like apes? It comes down to that. And, and in all sorts of different shapes, it comes to the face. At times she would catch and eat some insects. She would drink uh, in animal fashion by lapping water, or sometimes she would dip her arms in water and lick the water. When she was allowed to go free, she ran awkwardly singing, swinging her arms to the nearby reeds where she disappeared. Cocklove noted that these creatures has nothing this creature has nothing in common with the jez tarmac uh, copper nails or with the almas and there we go this is a most startling statement but one of utmost significance i mean there's a lot of people saying in the states that we have more than a half a dozen some people say a dozen i think there's probably a lot more than that I don't know what the ones that I look like. I mean, on the ones where I'm at, they it's a cross between these, uh, like what you just saw there, and the, the, the drawing and the Ohio grass man. I just, I guess. The one thing is that it was all black. And then the other one, the second one, was all rust color brown. So, fuck. And in talking this way, people think you're crazy, but uh, that doesn't really matter. Because they don't know what they're talking about. And that's what all these people... Are. I mean, when you find out the things I find out, what do you, what do you think is going to happen? You keep your mouth shut, or, you, if you, or if you don't want it to be ridiculed and ostracized. But I had nothing to lose by speaking the truth, because everyone already rejected me for other reasons before I had to. So. And I did... And nothing I did really was all that significant. Nothing was good. I mean, none of it was, you know, something that. Let's put it like everything that I got, that I have been rejected for, you could not throw me in prison for. Let's put it that way. That says something, doesn't it? This is the most startling statement, but one of the utmost significance and also one that has been totally overlooked. We find on an a, an analyzing the reports from the general Pomar's area that despite the variations of color, coat color, all ABFSs uh, there are, appear to be one type. This is about man size 
and in many respects very manlike with as is frequently mentioned something like a primitive language or at least a vocal communication system more elaborate than anything known among animals. Its footprints, while having very uh, widely separated an extra large big toe, are said to be human in form. This type, which in incidentally seems to be the same as the Caucasian cap captor, or captor, once again, K-A-P-T-A-R. Obviously, captor, or captar, if you remember. It is mostly commonly called by one of the names in the uh, Gul, and I'm not sure here. I think it's G U L I V A N V A N a van a Guli van group due of course to the regularity of the languages in the area extended north into the along the uh, Tian Shan or Tian Shans and east into the Kunlun's and the Karakorums. Moreover, I do not know of any remarks to the effects that there are more than one kind of ABMS. ABSM, excuse me. God, it doesn't feel right. I cannot get used to it. I read this whole book and you think at some point I'd be able to say it. I just cannot get used to ABSM. It just doesn't, it doesn't feel like it. <laughs> Throughout these three regions, the larger and more bestial Mata type with two semi-opposed toes begins only east of the Karakorams along the southern Tibetan rim and possibly in the Himalayas though and this is exceedingly strange i cannot actually find a single report of this type from any part of that range it would seem that the cockloves creatures from around uh, dunsgora are also of the galayavan type and that they extend north to the Grand Altai and beyond the Sayans. <laughs> uh, Sayans. Uh, it describes uh, of the description of those from the Nanshans, which is to say the northern rim of the Tibetan super uplands, they seem also to be similar these creatures which give very every indication of being a, a Neanderthal type of subhuman whose footprints exactly match those of Neanderthals discovered in a cave in Italy would seem would seem to be a mountain dwelling form. In fact, they are montane form for not one single report of them from down on either the lowlands or even on the Mongolian plateau itself has ever been recorded. From the latter, which is to say Mongolia proper, with the Kanjai Mountains uh, that arise in its center and the vast Gobi Desert together with the Alashan, the Ordos, the Turfan, and even possibly the lowlands of du, du, uh, Dungara and 
Tam Tamron. Tamron. If we get reports only of the little Amas, these are much smaller and apparently even more human and seem always to have been regarded simply as extremely primitive humans, hairy and without speech understandable to us, and have, and, but having more or less all the human qualities such as suckling human infants and even, it has been alleged, trading with normal humans and that they would leave skins at appointed places and take away certain simple basic articles left there by the nomadic tribesmen and return. There is even a report of a scholar in a Mongolian monastery who was half-breed almost. Really? This report comes from Professor R R Wright Rinchen's Rinchen mentioned previously and reads, there was a Lama in the Laman Gijin Gijin so Laman Gijin Monastery who was famous for his scholarship and known under the name of a son of an Alma Amesca. The father of this Lama supposedly was captured by Lamas and begot a boy with, the, with an Alma's woman. Both father and son eventually managed to escape by joining a passing caravan. The boy was allowed to become a pupil in a monastery and achieve scholarship fame, really. Well, that doesn't say much for the scholarship then, does it? <laughs> Or the, I mean, seriously, I mean, if a Neanderthal can, if, right? So easy a caveman could do it, right? The same informant, one Jindul from uh, Karumal of, of the Banks. Hunger District recently told Dr. Rinchen that the 1937 he saw in the monastery Maroon Kur I don't know if it's said I don't care the entire skin or hide of an almas which was fastened to the ceiling of the temple the skin was taken off by a cut along the back so that it remained practically intact and one could see that it was it had a human like it had human like whew, legs and arms the face was framed by long hair hanging from the head the entire skin was covered with Kabbalistic signs and painted by the Lamas. Uh, the, this Almas was supposedly killed in Gobi and brought as a gift to the monastery by a famous hunter, Mangal Durinchi. I don't even know if I'm saying these names right. I, I, I just, I know I keep saying it, but it's just it's so distraught. It's just very distraught. It's very disturbing that I can't say it. I mean, it says here in the bottom, um, uh, known locally by the names grouped around the stem, Kasai and Gaelic, or Gaelic, the later means wild as an at Gaelic, or at Gaelic, wild horse. The spring of 1948, the official caretaker of a cave known as the Witch Ca Witch's Cave near Torano, Italy. All the caves in Italy are government-controlled, 
obtain permission to blast through what proved to be 11 foot of flow stone forming a blockage to one of the cave's passages. In the off tour season, they had seen bats flying in and out of a small hole leading into this and had rightly assumed that unexplored areas lay beyond. On breaking through extensive passages with clean, smooth, wet clay floors were found. On these, there were enormous numbers of foot tracks of large cave bears, of modern appearing men, and of what are obvious Neanderthals together with many artifacts and even evidence of some kind of game played by throwing clay balls at a circle on the, on the wall. The clay seems to have been finally abandoned. No, the cave, it seemed, the cave seems to have finally been abandoned and sealed by the flowstone curtain about 50,000 years ago, and outlined traces of one of the Neanderthal footprints found therein as reproduced, Appendix A. And of course, that 50,000 year stuff, who the hell knows? But how can you, you know, after having these stories, and if it's possibly even provable, that kind of, you know why that's the reason why they don't want to talk about it, because it ruins everything. It doesn't just ruin, you know, uh, the foundation of science. It ruins religion itself. And in particular, there's a great question that needs to be asked. And that is, uh, uh, why did uh, they hide this from us? Why is it that they're so upset about us knowing about their other beings, a humanoid, humanids? What's the big deal? And I think part of the problem might just be that they might. Okay, I'm gonna see if we redo this. These are quite surprising. People. Opposite of the Georgian, uh, of what's really going on, you know, Western approaches, Russian find to Esau. What I am trying to say is that. It seems that this I. Well, I think this is part six now of. Whew. All right. Although I am getting somewhat ahead of my story, is that really? Getting ahead of yourself, are you? Um, I would like to point out that the idea of a half breed Neanderthal becoming a great scholar is not to be scoffed at. Though subhuman had relatively large brains, and while there is really no evidence that a large brain is necessary for a, a large in intellect, one should take to heart the couplet that states, a little brain, little wit big brain not a bit so and note that the Anatole F France's gray matter capacity was only uh, uh, 1100 cubic centimeters while that of the proto Neanderthal is uh, so lowly as uh, Rhodesian man uh, was 1280 does that really mean anything, honestly? Professor Rinchen already mentioned reports that a man by the name of Anouk, traveling in the South Gobi in 1934, was a companion noticed in the th thick, with a companion noticed in a thick growth of sick soul grass, a strange two-legged creature that started running away from them. 
and then Dennis, I think it was Zigzabee's, uh, Zagget, uh, Megan, uh, Megan, fuck if I know, uh, a sexual grandmother decided both and making lassos out of, of raw hide, they started to pursue the creature. The fast goby camels had no difficulty overtaking the creature whose body was covered with short wool. I have a hard time believing that too. I just have to know how fast these things were. Unless it was, it was sick. At the sight of people twirling a lasso, the creature issued such a piercing cry that frightened the camels. Would the that the frightened camels would not budge any further and the creature was able to escape behind a rocky furrow. Good for him. Yay. Then again, there is the story of a car caravan on the way to Kukukoto huh? in Inner Mongolia. The cavern was traveling from, the caravan was traveling from the region of uh, Yule Sutton uh, in eastern Mongolia and approaching the southern borders of uh, Kolkai, Kolkai, the borders of Kolkai, when it was decided to stop to rest near a place thickly grown with sex soul grass when they were ready to start again the man who was set to get together the camels could not be found anywhere an all experienced guy told the men that it in this location may be some zangin almas advanced and advised that more than one man should go searching. After a while, the three men who were sent out to search came to a cave and saw on the ground in front of it signs of a struggle between two people, one having shoes and, and the other barefoot. The frightened men did not attempt to. Well, that's nice. Can you go with count on your buddies? enter the cave and recovering the uh, camels return to their observations uh, to the caravan insisting that all should go to help their companion the old guide again cautioned them against such an act he stated that almas never kills people but having captured one will hold up for a while and will not come out of the cave. He suggested that they should wait till they came by on the way back and then attempt to free the comrade. Well, that's terrible. And so on their way back they came to the same spot and arming themselves with a gun they decided to hide near the cave and wait till the almas came out. They waited a whole day, and then towards sunset out of the cave merged two-legged creature covered with hair all over. Uh, a shot sounded, and the creature fell dead. Reloading a gun, the, man ran into the men ran into the cave looking for their lost companion. They found him, but he seemed wild and listless. He never told anyone what occurred in the cave. He avoided talking to people, and in two months' time, he died. Reverting to the creatures called Jez Tarmac, which is alleged to mean copper nails, meaning, of course, fingernails, we should n note that this name is applied to a larger, grosser, and more beastly type of ABSM than the uh, just Zungarin, uh, Kai's 
Gaiac. <laughs> I don't even know if I'm saying it right. And it doesn't really matter. And because no one's no one here is ever gonna call the and it, and it is alleged to be found on the super uplands of the Tibet. It is said to be clothed in rather long, shaggy, very dark gray to black hair and have fingernails of copper. The implication in the folklore on this type and and all undocumented stories about it asserts that asserts that their nails are actually made of copper. This idea is illogical and as near impossible as anything could be. But there could be a very simple and logical explanation for it. It is that the fingernails of the same primates, and uh, notably adult gorillas, are quite often bright colored, copper colored, and even look burnished. The explanation seems to be that um, they are strained, uh, they are stained, excuse me, they are stained in, as the material of which all nails and claws are made, known as uh, ker keratin, so readily is by the juices of certain fruits, barks, and berries on which they feed. I have collected monkeys of more than one species in Africa that display remarkable variations from the described co coat color and pattern by reason of bright red areas and the angel the injonial region. The injonial region. Injonial region. Or ingonial region? Let me see what that word's pronounced. I must be. People must think I must be nuts. And you know what? At this point, I think I have turned nuts. You know? It is what it is. I think I'm doing a pretty good job. I'm pretty sure I'm being better. Inguinal. 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 Not inguinal. Inguinal. Sometimes on the lower face and even on the chest and inner arms. After preparing skin, it is a cost custom to wash them in warm soap. <clears throat> Let's see. Okay. Wash some warm soap or soap water before drying them for museum pr preservation. On doing this to these monkey pelts, we were amazed to find that all this bright copper color washed out and left the fur pure white or yellow. Experiment elicited the fact that the ingestion of certain fruits selected for us by local people, although looking green and otherwise quite innocent, produce this vivid red stain on the pelts of caged monkeys within a matter of days by dribbling from the mouth and anus, and when said fruits uh, were eliminated from their diets, the color persisted for weeks. Their fingernails also remained bright copper color until they grew out from the bottom up. While everybody has 
for centuries been alluding to Tibet as the real center of ABS Emory. There turns out to be surprising little of a c concrete nature for, from the vast land. This may appear astonishing, but should not be regarded as indicating that there are no ABSMs there. <clears throat> Quite the contra contrary, it appears to be the true heartland of the whole matter, but as I have been at pains to try and explain above, there is a deep-seated proto-religious prejudice against speaking of the matter to foreigners while at the same time a number of foreigners to visit Tibet throughout the ages has really been extraordinarily small. However, almost all of those who visited have visited the country had written about their travels have mentioned the ABSMs. <clears throat> the American William W. Rockhill wrote in 1891 of hearing many stories from the Tibetans in Pekin, Pekin, Pekin? It's not. Pekin, it's Pekin, sort of China, and elsewhere of the hairy mountain people of the country, but he discounted these reports as being merely cases of mistaken identity, namely a bear. However, he got, he, he goes on to say, one evening a Mongol told me of a journey he had once made to the lakes in the company of Chinese trader who wished to buy rhubarb from the Tibetans who annually visit their shores, i.e. the lake of central Tibet, and they had seen innumerable herds of yak, wild asses, antelope, and uh, agarisun, a bam Brushy, brushy, I guess, brushy. This expression means literally wild man, and the speaker insisted that such they were covered with long hair, standing erect, and making tracks like men, and <clears throat> but they could not speak. Piki Chine, Ping King, uh, try this again. Peking, China. So that's Peking. according to Wikipedia, the city is renowned for its Peking. opulent palaces, temples. Now I'm saying Dickin. <laughs> it's Pickin, anyways. Pickin, Dickin. Man, I spent 12 hours. I never spend so much time to read a book. And 12 hours, and the amount of time I spent on this book, it's like reading a textbook. Uh, but it, at least, you know, textbooks, hopefully it would give you the phonetic pronunciation of a lot of these words. But this book doesn't give any break in any of this. <laughs> it just makes the assumption you're supposed to know or that by looking at that, that map that's going to make a difference, the little maps that he has in the front of the book. And I'm like, well, first of all, I can't do it because I'm, if I keep trying to flip back and forth on, <clears throat> there's one bad thing about archive.org, she can't do that. It's not a hands-on book, right? So I got to stay pretty much stuck this page. I mean, do I really want to flip all the way back to 320 pages or 22 or start another one? And I'm just like, no. And so there's so many limitations like this. But, <clears throat> like I said, I need to do this. I need to speak out loud. And um, I get like a double-edged sword for me too. It's because of my reading and my sight. So i got to use a bigger screen monitor to be able to see what I'm freaking I'm reading. 
I'm losing everything basically. It's it's a combination of getting old and having MS, and so I'm just losing all the our the human beings' natural abilities, and I'm not as smart to begin with. So, so it's quite a challenge. W. M. McGovern, in his book, to uh, uh, La Sa in disguise in 1924 says in nearly all parts of Tibet one finds the tradition of the existence of a primitive race of men former inhabitants of a land who have been driven out by uh, off the plains by the Tibetans and who now dwell only in the passes and the inaccessible mountain crags my own servant referred to them as snowmen. They are said to be and we have been at war with these things forever and a day, so that makes sense. Great hairy creatures, huge in size, and possessed with incredible physical strength, although having a certain low cunning, they are deficient in intelligence and it, it is the intellectual superiority of the Tibetans that has enabled them to oust the primitive snowman from the plains it is just like the story Esau and, and Jacob <laughs> of the Tibetans, the Tibetans okay out of the plains it has been permitted to no white men to meet these snowmen. He adds to, uh, another point that Rock Hill, who came across uh, this tradition in the extreme eastern part of Tibet, i.e. the land of the Dusta, suggests that his land of the Lamas, that the wild man may be nothing other than bears. For other parts of Tibet, this explanation could scarcely be valid, since in many parts of Tibet, as far example in Kapta, uh, Kapta Zong, the Zong, Pere, uh, and the surrounding districts, bears are unknown. This is rather significant statement in view of the constant insistence that all kinds of bears, although varieties of the eastern, let's see, the Eurasian brown bear are found all over Tibet, actually it does not matter. A uh, uh, Tupini Dam. I never heard of that word, phrase. A Tupini Dam. whether uh, they are so fond or not because uh, so fond or not because the Tibetans know their local animals and their distribution much better than any outsider do, outsiders do have completely different names for bears and ABSMs with qualifying terms for the various kinds of each none of which for one kind of creature could in any way be confused with those of the other and would never for one moment confuse one of the that didn't make any sense none of these kinds of creatures could be could in no ways none of these kind of creatures could in any way be confused with those of another and would never for a moment confuse one with the other. Furthermore, Rock Hill himself states in another passage that Lieutenant Lu Ming Yang, when speaking of the wild tribes of the north of the Hordes, the Horba country, assured me that men in that state of primitive savagery were to be found in Tibet.
some few years ago that was before 1890 author there was a forest fire on the flank of Mount Kalu east of Kazan Kenzi and the flames drove a number of wild men out to the woods these were seen by him they were very hairy their language was incomprehensible to Tibetans and they wore most primitive garments made of skins. This is a pretty startling statement for Rock Hill was rather a nasty kind of skeptic given to debunking anything possible and viewed not only with the, the then current um, pomposity of all Western travelers but with an almost modern craze for mediocrity and the disposal of all things that did not fit the accepted pattern. Having disputed of the ABSMs proper as bears standing on their hind legs, he then fell with a wallop into a report of primitive humans with hairy bodies in a place where they ought not to have been at least by Victorian estimation, and all on the say-so of a Chinese lieutenant. It is a strange commentary. On the closed mind of even a famous traveler and at the same time an eye-opener on our subject. For we must not forget that there is still ample room for a whole host of mere primitives, let alone ABSMs, all over this vast triangular triangle. Further, we must not forget those forlorn people, still at least until recently maintaining a bear cult called the Harry um, Ain Ainu, the Harry Ainu, of the Japanese island of Hokkaido, Hokkaido, Hokkaido. They seem to have been Caucasoids of an extremely early vintage, and they certainly were hairy and in some cases still are despite their persecution. Hairy chaps wearing skins running out of burning Tibetan forests do not quite coincide with then 1890 or even current anthropological beliefs, but this is no reason to gainsay their previous and continuous existence. Apparently, Tibetans took and still take all this quite uh, complacently. Just to make matters worse, the name Rock Hill must add still another brief passage that states legends concerning wild men in Central Asia were current in the Middle Ages. King Hathon of Armenia and uh, the narrative of his journey to the courts of the Batu, Batu and Mangu Khans in 1254 to 55 AD speaks of naked wild men inhabiting the desert southwest of the present Urumqi. Or room chai, whatever. Almost everybody who has traveled in Tibet, both before and since the date of these statements, have reported the same thing. Some have said they have met the creatures, but I stress again that these are all foreigners, since the Tibetans themselves just won't talk about the business. One story ha that has always 
fascinated me is that of of a uh, Kirk Kirk is the name uh Baya um Carolan who told the Russian investigating commission about a Chinese family who had started wandering during the war and finally settled in Tibet. It appears that one of the women disappeared and they thought she her to be dead. However, a year later she came back and told them the story that she was taken while gathering wood by what she called a kish kiak or wild man. She was comparatively little he was comparatively little different from an ordinary man but was covered with hair and could not speak. She also said that she was expecting a child by him. Hearing that, her husband killed her and he was taken by the police. The woman, the woman also told where the wild men's den was. They went up there and actually saw wild men and a woman and wild, wild men and women all covered with hair. On several occasions, Tibetans of higher education have said, see chapter 12, or have uh, been reported to have stated that they knew of three distinct types of ABSMs in or around the periphery of their super upland plateau. While in addition, they speak, speak of two animals with man-like or super anthropoid characteristics. These later they identified as first a giant monkey and secondly a, a, a mata. Of the other three man creatures, they are quite cognizant, cognizant affirming that they are first the little dwarf uh, ta e Emma, Emma, that's T H E dash I M A of the lower valleys, and second is the man sized hairy one, uh, i.e., the captor, Goli Evan, or Keys uh, Gaiac type, and the third, uh, sometimes quite something quite else. This is the mighty Dusta type known to the Chinese as the Ginsung, a real giant, shaggy coated, able to stay for long periods in the rugged country, dangerous, a stock raider, but possesses an almost exactly human type foot. This, they say, and everybody else agrees, is not found along either of the Himalayas or the southern Tibetan Rim, nor even in the Nan Shans, but is confined to the unnamed triangle between these. The upper Indochina and the Chinese escrapement. This same type stem seems to prevail also in the Tapa Shan and the Xinlings. The range between Xinxai and the Gobi. And again north along the mighty uh, Kinjans, Kinjans uh, that separates the Gobi from the from Manchuria. I don't know if I said that right. And on and on into the little Kinjans, Kinjans. Uh, maybe that, that, that's a river that they might be able to find the pronunciation for. But I might.
Kin Jens. Ling Sheng. Kin John. Kin Jens. Kin Jones. Kin Jones. So uh, the mighty Kin Jones uh, that separates the Gobi from the Man from Manchuria, and uh, on into the little Kin Jones that lies athwart the north edge of the province. Also, as I said before, there are indications that this type of ABSM may exist still further north in the Stanovius. Uh, who does hung does her get ins and even the anadrars anadrars this is of the utmost significance since it is the only a skip from there to Alaska while this does to type a p s m seems to confirm very closely or conform very closely if not to be identical with our sasquatches and omas here indeed is a strange situation to contemplate we start out with the suggestion that there might possibly be some one kind as yet uncaught and undescribed animal probably an anthropoid or a race of runaway human delinquents in the Himalayas which somehow got colorfully called abominable snowmen and we end up with a whole galaxy of unknown spread over five continents and concentrated in eastern upper land Eurasia whereby the word of those people who know most about the subject locally speak of speak the local languages and have devoted most time to the matter there appear to be no less than five very distinct types each with its own characteristics and habit namely one the mountain neanderthalers of the west two the little almas also neanderthalers and mere primitives of the host hot deserts three the bestial uh, mata of the Tibetan upper plateau four the, uh, the giant uh, uh, zuta a giant path, giant path, path, okay giant thickus thickus Giant pathicus. I can't say it. Giant can. Giant pathicus. Giant pathicus. The giant pathicus. Uh, Toke or Sasquatch type. And five, the tiny tropical forest dwelling. Te Emma. Of the. Southern valleys. This may sound fash, uh, fabulous, but the deeper you dive into the reports and the background, the more obvious and logical it becomes. Distinctive nature of each of the five is per perfectly in accord with the varying nature of the other groups of mammals. And take, for instance, the wild sheep of this area. There are distinctive species and or races in each of the great mountain blocks while other hoofed animals replace these on the lowlands and comparative low or comparative lowlands on the set of on set on the hot deserts other on the upland cold deserts then also the actual geographical distribution is also perfectly consistent and that one kind inhabits the far west 
the Caucasus and the western fringes of the plateau, another comparative lowlands of the middle and a third in the eastern mountainous edges, still another the Tepatan Plateau and its superimposed mountain ranges, and the last and and the last only warm valleys of the extreme southern uh, periphery of the, the area. These divisions furthermore coincide with the distributions, the distribution of both vegetation and vegetational types of growth. For instance, the arrangement of the latter going north from the Pamirs to the Sayans up to the Great Barrier Parallels, but is different botanically from that going up the eastern escarpment from Indochina to the Stanovias in Siberia. The whole picture, in fact, despite its enormous complexity and our gross overall lack of knowledge of the area is perfectly logical and consists with all natural facts and factors. To reiterate, and I cannot help doing this, and for some very real reasons, we should wipe away our sense of helplessness and hopelessness on taking our first look at map 15 and just remember that there that this tremendous mismatch may be quite simply divided into five parts the great barrier in the west the central desert basins uh, and the great barrier and escarpment of the on the east fronting uh, manchuria manchuria and china the, the Tibetan super uplands and their mountains, and last, the fringe areas of the Himalayas. This is Eastern Eurasia in, as it were, a nutshell. The only things left are the two enormous masses of uplands and mountains in Siberia, west and east of the Lenin Lene river respectively this however does not at the moment concern us and so we find ourselves ending our world tour in an area that is only on stage remote remo only on stage removed from where we started the animal life and much of the vegetation as a far of Far Eastern Siberia is identical to that of our extreme Northwest. What is more, as you go south from the Bering straight on either side down through the Siberia on the Asian side or through the Alaska to the Yukon and British Columbia on the American you pass through the same succession of vegeta vegetational belts and mountainous zones at each latitude. Many large animals, like the brown or dish-shaped bears and the, long, and the large red deer or American elf, elk, have crossed from one of the other in comparatively recent times. The Marids the Marids seem to have done the same too, and the Arctic and Eskimo type Mongoloids even later, unless they were on both sides uh, all the time. As I asked at the outset, what was there to prevent the Neo Giants from doing so also at some time? They are, of all the ABSMs, apparently the most rugged, surpassing in this respect, the Neanderthals, the Captor Geli, or Gob, Avians, the desert-dwelling Almas, the little warm forest T. 
I am I I must the metas do not do likewise seem to me fairly reasonably for it would appear that they are more apes than men and like all that and like all of that elk are neither Catholic in their tastes nor so readily adapted as are the hominids. Like the gorillas of Afri in Africa and the orangs in Indonesia, they got into a special environmental niche and have remained stuck therein. Appendix A, the importance of feet. <coughs> the study of footprints and foot trails, the difference between which was discussed earlier in this book, form the subject of a very precise science called ichnology. This discipline is employed in quite a number of fields, notably in police work and in uh, paleontology. The identification of the tracks of living animals in snow and mud has, of course, been an art in hunting since time immemorial, and it is a great interest to the field naturalist. It's more psychological aspects were also discussed when we first introduced the matter of ABSM tracks. We should now consider the details of this discipline. Tracks, the word I shall use from now on, unless dealing specifically with a single print, are caused by gravity. The first requirement is that the object uh, on top that presses down be composed of a denser material uh, than that upon which it is pressed. But this does not mean that tracks will invariably result. Thus a body may made of steel if rolled across a sheet of lead knees not leave tracks. There appears here another factor, that of weight, which results in the beginning of the erection of a comp complicated formula. Above a certain weight, the upper body will leave tracks, but the point at which it starts to do so is also dependent upon the, the compressibility of the underbody or surface. Then again, tracks can either be pressed or punched into a substance. In other words, energy, in addition to mere gravity, and gravity may be exerted. In this case, the point at which an impression begins varies according to quite a number of factors, which fortunately need not concern us since they lie in realms of engineering that do not apply to purely biological matters. Nevertheless, one must bear in mind that there is a considerable difference in appearance between a print and a print made by pressing and one made by punching an object downward into a surface. The former will be found to be surrounded by little cracks all running inwards to the gutter of the print, while the latter will be surrounded by a sort of levee of, or ridge. One of the easiest way to spot an artificially made print is to find such an impact ridge around a point where 
there is no cause for it under natural conditions pertaining on the terrain. By this, by this is meant where the creature, and this does not apply to, to machines, has no cause to jump. Jumping results in application of weight and to normal gravity and so is equivalent to punching. Thus a creature running rather than walking will leave differently formed individual prints than though than, than going downhill and they will be quite other than when it's going uphill. Already the matter becomes, as you may readily agree, complicated, but there are several further complexities. Perhaps the most notable is the area of the object which makes any print, and in the case of animals, the number of obje such objects, i.e. hands, feet, tail, and other appendages employed and so walking, running, hopping, and jumping, or otherwise progressing. The other most important factor is n naturally the nature of the material or surface into which the tracks are impressed. This is itself an enormously complicated subject. Tracks may be left in gravel or sand all of which are, of course, much denser than any animal foot that passes over them. This is due to their particulation or looseness. They are dry and such substances range widely in consistency from what are called screes. of uh, some time an enormous boulder piled against the sides of, of mountains to dry pl plaster of, of a Paris. Much finer substances have now been artificially developed, but in nature we need not concern ourselves with anything much finer than what we call a fine dried silt, which is a little coarser than dry plaster. There are two types, two other types of solids in which imprints m may be left. There are first materials such as lead that are themselves malleable or what is commonly called soft or sec secondly solutions in the widest sense of the word. This means, properly speaking, wet. We need not overlook concern our, we need not overly concern ourselves with the first since such substances may be regarded as non-existent in nature. This is to say in non-human world, second is of course the most important type of material in which the tracks of animals appear. And this goes for snow, which is in many respects holds an intermediate position since dependent upon temperature and may be either a particulated material or uh, a mere wet mixture. Prints can thus be left in three kinds of substances, dry as sand, wet as muds, and snow, or snow which has to be separately classified. There are those such as the technologists of police, laboratories, and road construction engineers who know so much about the factors just named and the results of making impressions 
and various substances that it would really startle you. On the other hand, certain paleontologists have made profound studies on this subject and most notably in connection with the inter interpretation of fossil footprints of early amphibians, reptiles, mammals, and birds. The findings of all three groups of specialists, of course, coincide for, as I say, acknowledges, uh, acknowledge as a very precise science. However, most unfortunately, totally insufficient application has been made of their findings and ABS Emory. Also, there has been an extraordinary lack of ap appreciation of the basic theorem of ichnology, which is simply stated that a print can be left only by a subject, uh, an object that exactly mirrors it. A term that should be self-explanatory. This brings us to the question arising from the confirmation of vertebrate animal feet. For some reason, there may well be no reason, it just so happens that the first creatures with backbones to crawl out of the water onto land dispensed with all but five of the raised digits on the fourth appendage they retained. Okay, this gave all of us land vertebrates a basic uh, pre um, uh, pentadactyl pattern. So a pentadactyl pattern, i.e., four legs each with five fingers or toes. <clears throat> True, there are some animals like whales that have somehow again reduplicated the number of phalanx and their digital extremities. This is actually one of the most extraordinary things about zoology as it flies in the face of one of the basic precepts of genetics, namely that characteristics once Loss cannot be resuscitated uh, from the same source. The additional phalanx of the crustaceans are phytogenetically developed by reduplication. This basic five fingered and five toed pattern speaks much for the utility origin of all land vertebrates, the amphibians, reptiles, birds, and mammals. Many forms of all these major groups have at one time or another lost one or more phalanx uh, in various digits, whole digits, or even whole limbs. The snakes, for instance, have lost everything, and the result may be the most readily seen in the mirrored prints uh, by the hand and feet of various types. And from such prints, a great deal about their makers may, by inference, from known types be reconstructed. This brings us to the classification of feet and specifically of mammalian extremities. Happily we do not have to go into this vast question and many con concentrate upon those of the primates, i.e. the order to which we belong together with the apes, monkeys, uh, lemuroids, and a few more obtruse types like the feather tails. The primate foot 
as opposed to their hands, which we may also form now on ignorance, is pedidactyl, i.e. five-toed, uh, but is otherwise of a very variety of forms. These forms may be classified in various ways, but two sets of factors are of particular interest to us. The first is whether they are what is called wholly uh, a plantigrade or not. The second, whether the big, great, or first toe is opposite to or lies alongside and points in the same direction as and or is bound to the other toes. A plantigrade foot means that its own stands and walks, excuse me, the owner stands and walks with the whole undersurface from the tip of its toes to its heel, which is to say that the last bone of the ankle on the ground. Some primates, such as the tiny tarsiers, do not do this. The ankle bones being greatly elongated, man hominids, apes, pungens, uh, um, and most of monkeys, seminoids, are plantigrade. Further, none of these three groups of higher primates have long enough nails to produce crawl-like excretions which touch the ground and leave notable marks, though those of some cynocephaloids, i.e. bamboos, bamboos, and Maracs, no, no, macaques, not maracs, macaques, may do so when they are running or galloping. There are a few, if any, as a matter of fact, other animals that do not leave claw marks. Then again, claws and nails, although having a similar origin anatomically, are not identical structures, but this is also needs not fortunately concern us further. In dealing with primate footprints, we are therefore primarily concerned with the nature and position of the big or great toe. The only one that does not have an opposed big toe is the hominid group. And nonetheless, this digit in hominids also varies considerably in the degree to which it is set off from the other four toes, from both the prints found in the cave at the Torrano in Italy and from the skeletons of a whole foot found in Crimea, we now know that the big toe of the Neanderthals were rather widely separated. There are people living today who have feet not unlike those of Neanderthalers, notably certain Amerid Amerimids, uh, from the extreme southern end of South America. Whew. Photo in the article of Dr. Carlton S. Cohn, uh, Natural History, January 1961, and some Australoids However, there is no indication, even among those which we know, of any evidence whatsoever of a truly opposed big toe 
among any hominid. One known fact about abnormalities among human feet is nothing less of a, some significance to our story. And this is that shown in two photographs of a strange type in which the second toe is larger than the first, sometimes more massive and also widely separated from the remaining three toes. This is a more odd than the second and third toe of normal modern man are partially webbed. Which ones again? The second and third toe are partially webbed. Yes, they are. I got stubby as fucking toes and they're all small. Fucking hell. Partially webbed. If a foot normal or abnormal of this nature developed or even merely occurred, one would have supposed uh, that the second or third toe together would have become widely separated from or on from on the one hand the bigger toe and on the, the other the remaining two. When this abnormality occurs both the big and the second toe tend to curl downward and inward, not unlike those of the meta, but they are still not opposed. <clears throat> Let us now analyze and try to analyze, or try to analyze the prints left by the four types of uh, ABSMs. These we will arrange in the following order. 1. The proto-pygmies. 2. The almas. 3. The neo-giants. 4. The very different meta-type. It will be seen from the sketches of the outstanding types of known human feet accompanying this appendix. That those of the living pygmy human types, such as the Negrillos or the Negatos, show a distinct tendency towards a very short, broad foot with rather large and proportionate and widely splayed toes and a very constricted or narrow heel. It is hardly even a step from them to the Sadapas, the Tel Imas, uh, <clears throat> and other alleged pygmy ABSMs, such as tiny human type uh, plantigrade flat foot, does not, however, begin to approach the form of the various bears and not even the Malaysian sun bear, Hel Arctus. Coming f to the prince allegedly left by what I have called the Almada type, one finds that they are hardly in any respect different from those of the Neanderthalers left in the cave in Italy. This in turn perfectly accords with the now expressed belief of the Russian scientists of the former are but living representative living, living representatives of the latter. Despite their relatively low plantar index, i.e. the number of times their width goes into their length, they are hardly at all 
non-human. In fact, they can be matched by the prints left by not a few modern men living today and most notably by persons who have never worn shoes or other footgear. We hardly have to discuss these tracks any further except to mention that such have been rumored from many places other than Eastern Eurasia, such as, I may say, Northwest North America, South America, and Africa. But how are we to tell whether such prints, if they are ever really existed, were left by some wild thing or by local men walking without foot gear and happening to have a Neanderthaloid type feet. Other real problems begin with the Neo Giants. Here I want first to try and wipe away a lot of dross. It has been said and repeatedly that such tracks and prints have been found all over northern Indochina and on northward through the 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 are formed what and northward through and and, and northward through the arc formed by the uplands and mountains of Switzerland uh Schwartzen Schwartz Schwartz oh, fuck S C C H S Z E C H W A N Switzwin Switwin Switwin via the uh Sinslings to Manchuria. Some up to 20 inches long humanoid type prints are also said to have been found in the Mato Grosso, the Mato Grosso and in Pangaea in South America. This may be so, but after lo these many years, I have been completely unable to obtain any photograph uh, or any sketch of one that is stated to have been made on the spot. I have several sketches made by members of expeditions to these places, but sketches made in retrospect after questioning and mostly in my apartment in New York, but nothing original. The only areas from which I have been able to obtain such first-hand photos or sketches or plasters casts have been from British Columbia and Northern California. These prints at first look wholly human and I may say a bit ridiculous. However, on further analysis they display other qualities as may be seen from the accompanying sketch, they show one or two extremely old characteristics that are definitely not typically human. As photos of the whole tracks of these monsters have shown, they walk with their heel pointed straight forward not pigeon toed like bears or in many or in any may out outturned like most men. Thus they must flex about or across in a line that forms an arc or arch, excuse me, at right angles to that line of travel behind the toes. Then this means that although the whole foot is enormous and at first looks very long, it is really a very short and broad one with an index of only 1.61. A friend of mine, Mr. Fred Lou, 
uh, uh, long and the shoe business has worked out trade equivalents of this proportion these proportions working from one of our plaster casts with an overall length of 15 and 3 fourth inch and a width of 7 inch a number 21 shoe would be needed but none less than 13 sizes and the width greater than Shows those images of toes. And then it says here um, some diagrams. One, a human adult, West Caucasian imprint in clay mold. So that's a human foot. Two, second adolescent, uh, human adolescent, 14 and a half years, West Caucasian. Wet in print, left foot on hard surface. Three. Human child, ten and a half years, West Caucasian, ca 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 Caucasoid, I should be saying, not Caucasian, Caucasoid. Wet in print on left foot on hard surface. For infant, two and a half years, West Caucasoid, wet imprint of left foot on hard surface. And then five, human adult, cro man from clay floor of cave in France. Definitely much uh, broader. Uh, six human adult South Amarin from mud of uh, riverbank. Uh, Chris, Chris, uh, Kiss Shoe, Patagonia. Look how wide that is. Beefy it is. Um, seven subhuman Neanderthal from moist clay floor cave to Arano, Italy. Look at how beefy and wide it is. Uh, eight A B S M, uh, July. Yavan type from a sketch of track and mud uh, Kirk's SSR looks more beefier huh look how longer the, the, the toe is too a curl then we got 9 ABSM uh, Meta from photo of cast made by photo print in snow by Eric Shipton. Look at that. <laughs> That's pretty wild. Um, we don't seem to get that many like that. Yeah. Okay, 10. Ape, unknown form, sketch made by Charles Cordier and the Congo. Overall, 37 years. So they got the egg. Look how far out that big toe is. 11, ape, lowland gorilla, from photo of cast a foot. 12, uh, ape chimpanzee outline of extended foot from plaster cast. 
Then we got 13 human adult Bushmen. Look at that. From sketch made from cast. 14 Sasquatch. Uh, from tracing of deep print and and firm wet clay. And I can see you could end up having thinking you had four toes. And instead of five. Uh, 15 uh, ABSM uh, Juzta uh, drawn by author under supervision of General or Gerald Russell. Sixteen ABMS question a cocoon dar curry sketch made by Charles Courier in the Congo. Uh, overall ten centimeters. That is a very bizarre looking one if there was one. But look how long the big toe is there. Seventeen human Malaysian Negrato from photo of cast. I wonder how accurate any of this is. Eighteen uh, ABSM Sedapa. Very beefy, weird, wide, very long extended front toe. Um, 19 ABSM Te Ima. Long big toe. 20 ABSM. Apamandai uh, sketch made by Charles Courier in the Congo overall 20 uh, centimeters very long look at that toe weird 21 uh, ape orangutan outline of extended foot from plaster cast much, look how much better it is too um 22 ape did i say that already 21 orangutan 22 ape orangutan print a knuckle uh and foot x hall of hall vel velmans Twenty-two. Twenty-three ape silvery gibbon outline extended foot from plaster cast. Twenty-four monkey old male rhesus drawn from a live specimen X Holzman Hill. And then we go here. Then we got looks like bears in that top row left. Asiatic brown bear, uh, Ursus Arctos, left hind, hind and right forefoot imprint. Top row and right North American black bear, uh, Ur Arctos Americanos, left hind and right foot forefoot imprint. So we have the Asiaca bear, and then we have the American black bear. Sunro, um, a puma, mountain lion, Prophilus concolor, right hind foot, fore and hind part of large cat are very similar. So also are all prints of the great cats. So that's the great cat one right there. Yes, sir. Looks like one. 
um, looks like my high school uh, my uh, high school um, uh, that was this symbol for it wildcats um, the right North American porcupine uh, arrow thizing door set em. left hinge and right forefoot imprints and then the bottom row is the famous footprint of Carson City Jail outline portion was restored by Hark Hark by Dr. Harkness. This was the left footprint and sandstone. Not very impressive, to be honest with you. But I don't know if any better, so. The tracks were not found in the jail yard, but some miles distance. The bottom row right, a stink ground sloth, my lobdon, the skeleton of a left foot from the side. The width of the shoe, i.e., the EEI -E second, is, it means that the curious double inner pad under the ball of foot has something to do with the basal joint of the big toe and not with the end or outer end of the first uh, metacarpal. If this is so, the foot bends flex along the the arch that runs between the two pads all the other toes are not just extraordinarily but so exceptionally long that they cannot be of a typical human form but if they are that long why don't they splay or alternatively why don't they not why does not the mud which the tracks were left well or squeezed, squeezed up between them as not as it does with even a normal human foot. In all the tens of thousands of prints that have now been found and examined of these creatures this has never been observed to have occurred. The only thing that I know of that could prevent this and at the same time produce such a shape left to right ridge under flexure of toes is an almost complete web between all of them. Thus, although the neo-giant prints at first look almost completely human they are not they um, have a double first sub digital pad they are extremely short and broad for their size and the second to the fifth toe seems to be conjoined and significance the significance of these print points should by now be appreciate it. This leaves us with the most abominable problem of all, the meta type prints. The abominable and abominable that this is indeed. These simply do not fit into any other pattern. They are definitely not punjal and that the big toe though enormous is not truly opposed similarly they are not more humanid uh, and that said big toe is set off however the second toe looks for all the world like a semi opposed digit such a condition is not known in any mammal as we already pointed out, 
the development of such a condition is somewhat more likely to be able to be undertaken by a pungent with an already offset or opposed big toe than by a hominid without one. These prints are not those, those of a string of foxes all jumping into the same hole in the snow as we by now know all too well. Also, this has happens, this has happens, not yet been sufficiently stressed. The prints show very clear indications or indication of a rather complex muscular musculature which although so far unknown in any other animal accords perfectly with what which is expected if one developed such a foot and was bipedal most but by no means all of the meta tracks have been found in snow. The others have been found in mud and sometimes first in one and then in the other in a continuous continuous line. This absolutely and positively deposes any other proportion, pr pr proposition that has constantly been put forward, namely that the prints were made by a comparatively small creature, uh, were then subsequently enlarged by melting of snow with and without r regulation. Considerable work has now been done on the phenomenon and it is true that small prints may become large or large ones in this way. And it is an extraordinary fact that the tracks seem and or appear in some uncanny way to grow to fit them. By this, I mean that optical illusion or whatever, the stride seems to grow to grow. This, of course, is basically impossible, whereas exactly the reverse should occur because as the prints get bigger and bigger, their peripheries must get closer together. I, uh, I observed this most closely at my farm by exclu excluding all form going near a set of tracks made by my small wife wearing close-fitted boots and fresh, firm snow from the house to the trash disposal affair beyond our lawn. And in a few days, her prints had grown to enormous proportions and looked incredibly sinister and as seen from an upper floor window appearing for all the world like those of positive giant and with a giant stride. Actual measurements, however, showed that the stride had, of course, remained as original lay, lay down, as originally lay down. Nevertheless, none of these things actually or illusory can occur in mud. I didn't say that right. Illusory, uh, actual illusory, can occur in mud. The meta tracks and prints are, in fact, by far most puzzling of all, especially since such persons as Shipton, Bordent, and others obtain clear photos of them taken from directly above. Here is obviously a bipedal creature of considerable size and weight that inhabits the Himalayas and the ranges north 
of the Tibetan Plateau. It was the original abominable snowman and it comes out as the last abominable enigma. And then in Appendix D, the known mammalian fauna of the Himalayan area. The known mammalian fauna of the Tibetan Plateau, the Parmas, and the Himalayan ranges is very extensive. And the last area we find a combination of typical Eurasian and Oriental forms, together with several unique types not found elsewhere. We are concerned in our discussion only with mammals and that other animals do not have hair. And it has been hair above all else, other than footprints and tracks, that has brought forward an explosion in ABSMs, and especially in these areas. Moreover, from some reason, for some reason, but not one which does not seem quite logical to me, it has been the larger mammals that have been suggested as the possible origin of these hairs, which I have been said to be of yetis. This actually need not be final, for there are many medium-sized and small mammals, uh, the, uh, the hairs of which are just as long, and some are almost as sturdy as those alleged to be from ABSMs. Some alleged ABSM remains have been proved to, be, to have been made from the goat-like animals called the Soro. Very interesting, the goat. Jacob, Esau, Esau, hairy like a goat. The hairy man. While some of the Californian hairs have been identified on the one hand as those of moose, not found in the area incidentally, on the other as those of large cats, i.e belly hairs uh, are from by puma port uh, port bellis con color therefore it is of first importance to list those large mammals known from the tibetan and himalaya area that might be used to make yeti artifacts the most stand outstanding of these are primates, Hulak Gibbon, then there's the Langers, the snub nose Monkey, I don't know if you read the scientific names, I think we're done with the book actually, that was one hell of a way to end a book, um, Carnivora, Snow Leopard, Giant Panda, Lesser Panda, Wolf, Red Bear, Blue bear, snow bear, Himalayan black bear, sloth bear. And then it says Arteo Dactyla. It is Camel Lines, um, Bactrin Camel, uh, Servants, Red Deer, uh, and there's a couple of different red deer, uh, Thorolds, deer, bovines, jack, mythen, antelopines, the zirin, goa, goats, and then it just goes to the list of that stuff. That's all that, not that important to me. And it's a weird way to end the book. And then it has the bibliography, and we'll see what kind of books he has to suggest. Ooh. Five miles high, evening, Moscow. Uh, Bombless little. Bombless snowman. Um, looks like we're done. Boy, I'm glad we're done with this book. I'm done with this book. 
I'm so glad. Traces de Yeti. That was one tedious fucking book. Let me see, is there any closing comment? I don't even know if I want to uh, look at a um, a book. So it has just in the back of it more light reading f from Pyramid. That was light. That if that was light reading. I am hopeless. That's all I gotta say. That was not like that. Actually, that was more difficult than reading an actual textbook. My book. I'm serious. We're done with the book. That was very unceremonious. But damn, that was a lot of work. Damn. And so that was, once again, uh, the abominable snowman legend come to life. Ivan T. Sanderson. It's supposed to have been a great book. It's recommended. It, it, I don't know if it's recommended, but he's recommended by Keel. And I have to say, that was one bitch of a book to read. Whew. I hope the next one is not as bad. You're going to try. Go all the way. Otherwise... Don't even start. If you are going to try, go all the way. This could mean losing girlfriends, wives, relatives, jobs, and maybe your mind.